From the center of the galaxy, this is Force Center, a show about Star Wars pop culture in the ultimate adventure, life itself. An adventure I think we've all had a lot of this week. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw. I'm Kat Napsack. And I'm Jennifer Landa. And this is The Bad Batch Report. <laughs> 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 oh. uh, well, that, that noise was easy to identify. That's the audience's soul, right, Ken, after watching this two-parter? Absolutely. Some heartbreaking stuff we're going to get into, of course. But, man, I felt, felt it in so many ways. Yeah, this, these were a, a brutal couple of episodes. Um, it, it, it hurt good, I guess. We can talk about that. Anyway, we are uh, doing our Bad Batch report here, talking about Season 3, Episode 10, Identity Crisis, directed by Saul Ruiz and written by Amanda Rose Munoz. And season three, episode 11, Point of No Return, directed by Nate Villanueva and written once again by Amanda Rose Munoz. Story editor Matt Machenovitz is credited every episode this season. Um, we are recording our Bad Batch report a little bit uh, later. We had some schedule conflicts and we always love being honest on Force Center. So we're just going to be honest that I think all three of us have had extremely busy weekends <laughs> between life, uh, other Star Wars work. So we are excited to be here and discuss Badge Batch. But if you sense any sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, energy from us, I think we're all feeling a little uh, beaten down, like our not as bad, hopefully, as our favorite characters from Bad Batch, but a little bit of honesty here for you as we record on this Monday morning. Ken, anything to add uh, to that honesty? Yeah. Can, yeah, yeah. I, I, sorry. I'm also, when I'm low energy, I maybe occasionally get grumpy. Now would be a great time to follow us on the social media platform of your choice. Uh, we announced that we were doing this episode late, and the amount of, uh, hey, where's your review uh, comments <laughs> that came across, uh, we announced it. And we also said it on the previous episode, so <laughs> we're here. I had to travel, uh, doing it uh, in a hotel room, which I'm glad we didn't try, because even the, I paid for the high internet hotel room, you know, join the our club and get high internet in the hotel, did not work. <laughs> I, I could I had trouble watching these episodes, um, mm. and uh, we all had things to do. Uh, you know, again, it's life. This is the grind of, of the show. But anyways, uh, yeah, I'm trying not to be grumpy. And then these episodes, when I finally, I also didn't watch them for two days. Mm -hmm. And trying to avoid social media spoilers is fine, because that's just natural. It wasn't mm -hmm. like anyone was ruining it for me. But then, you know, people were tweeting us direct questions. I'm like, I haven't watched it. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't watched it. Uh, all that to say, we're here. I'm here. Hi. Yes. Yeah, I'm very excited to discuss. And Jennifer, you've been busy, I'm sure, with many life things, but we should also uh, let people know that you released your big Jedi Beat episode about Carrie Fisher, the kind of big finale of your miniseries, for now, we can talk about <laughs> more later. <laughs> but you've been working hard on this Carrie Fisher episode, took a couple extra weeks to, to really get it right. Uh, how are you feeling now that it is uh, released to the world? I feel like I have just given birth. I am so <laughs> tired, drained. I need a cranberry juice fruit cocktail like they give you in the hospital, in the maternity <laughs> ward. Uh, yeah, I was up till five this morning. So I I, uh, I, I don't have a brain right now. Yes. <laughs> we'll stumble through this. Yes, we'll I understand. This. I think I'm going on about eight hours sleep total since Thursday, maybe. <gasps> Probably that's a little bit of exaggeration. Maybe 12 to 16 hours. Uh, yeah, Whoa. juggling lots of different projects. And it was uh, my, my wife had a dance performance uh, that I was lucky uh, to go and uh, watch and be a part of. But that was uh, it was a whole thing. Uh, mm -hmm. And I watched these episodes on Wednesday. Uh, no, Tuesday night at midnight. So I've been sitting with them. <laughs> the pain and the beauty and uh, waiting to process and discuss. So let's uh, get into it from there. Uh, Jennifer, what was your overall emotional reaction? Did you like these episodes? Were you deeply affected by them? How did you react? I loved the first of the two episodes. I cried and I was like, is it because I'm tired or because <laughs> the story is so emotional? <laughs> Whoever the performer was that played the Eva character, bravo, mm -hmm. phenomenal. But yeah, that episode was fantastic. And the second episode was great too, which is different type of vibe, obviously. Yeah. D did you feel about the second episode that, um, did you feel like you were ahead of the show just because we've kind of known because of mm, peaking, yeah. you know, Molly Damon in particular, you know, zeroed in, <laughs> enhanced the frames and, and realized, yeah, I think Pablo is going to be attacked. Were mm. you affected by feeling like uh, that, that you knew it, where it was going? Maybe that's what that was, because I was a little not quite as engaged, not quite as gripped 
because mm-hmm. you're right. I kind of was one step ahead. Uh, yeah. But it was still great. A lot of action. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, is somebody going to die? Is it? No. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was some uh, high stakes for our, for Wrecker and Gonky. Oh, yeah, terrible. I know. Gonky. Uh, Ken, what was your big uh, overall reaction to these two episodes? Uh, just the mood, the music, everything they accomplished and pulled off in both episodes, but particularly the first one, it was it was heartbreaking upon first viewing. And, you know, it was also also uplifting because I, I think a lot of us, we're not, I'm not alone here, we're, we're like, I knew it. I knew Emery Carr had a heart. I knew there was something going to go uh, with there. Uh, uh, and I liked uh, I liked all that. The second episode... Um, yeah, you're right. I, I had a, a vibe of, ah, this, here we are. Here we are. We're at Pabu. We're losing Pabu in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and then, again, I want to say, I'm not mad at anyone. I'm not, I, I get it. This is our job. So you would assume that I watch it early. I had several people tweet to me, hey, what do you think uh, uh, Omega was thinking when she was taking off the Tantus at the end of the episode? Like, so I, the episode oh, no. started, I was like, well, I kind of kind of know where this is going. But again, that's life. I have two days that have viewed it. It's not on you. That's on me. But so second episode, my relationship with it was different. But it doesn't matter. It stands the test of time as, as, as a great episode. And, and episode 10 is, I think, one of my favorite episodes of Bad Batch. Yeah, no. And uh, uh, Omega going to Tantus, not to uh, rub salt in the wound, I think was the sort of surprise of the episode. Yeah, for me, yeah. because it yeah. was, mm. yes, everything else was, it, it was great. And thematically, we'll talk about it a ton. It, it's not like I thought the episode was poor. It was mm. just like the, well, <laughs> we know this pain is coming. It's almost like a medical procedure that's <laughs> like, you know, you have to do of like, I'm not looking forward to this, but yeah. I should get that checked. And also Pabu will be invaded. Like, got to yeah. get through it. Uh, and <laughs> Omega uh, going back in the way she went back and her attitude was mm-hmm. to me like the triumph and the, the surprise and the. The glimmer of hope in mm-hmm. in all the horror um mm-hmm. yeah like like all uh episodes of bad batch uh, but particularly really building through season two into season three i think the triumph of it is a lot of it is the it is the story but it's also the execution that the animation the performance the music yeah. is all so designed to make you feel it uh just the beautiful rendering of actual twilight on pabu like the time mm-hmm. of day on an ocean where there's like those beautiful shots of the island with the glittering lights of community and then that brief bit of glowing orange on the horizon as the sun goes down and all you're left with is, is the tormented blue clouds like it's easy to just watch the episode and go well who is uh cx2 what's mm-hmm. gonna happen blah blah mm-hmm. blah but it's those those the the power of the images in the way it's done that makes you feel it and oh it's twilight on pabu (laughs) is uh you know both these episodes did all those great moments of just the way the story was told is is brutal and makes you feel it i agree uh the uh, the second viewing i was able to watch uh quickly this morning before recording on 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 my normal size tv the first viewing was on my you know cell phone in in a, in a hotel while rain and wind pounds against the window i there was a moment where cx2 is about to do something dastardly but i was like oh look how beautiful that was <laughs> just this i'd hang that on a wall and he's about mm. to blow up the marauder but that's wonderful yeah that's great beautiful beautiful horror um yeah and i think uh, a couple of other big picture observations and we can get into the the details of the themes uh we've often discussed bad batch as a sort of tour of this early imperial era and i think timeline wise it's getting later and later um it was affecting to me right away that first scene in the first episode that we uh, uh, star wars fans have known that it's not safe to be a a little baby with the force (laughs) in this era i don't know if we've ever just seen the scene of a Mm. totally unconnected to any lore unconnected to any other character We've seen many a Padawan run during Order 66. But I think maybe this is the first time that we've really got to viscerally see in live action. It's just a a baby with the force being turned in. You know, it really, uh, you know, over the years, there's always been that discussion of um, how did everybody forget about Jedi in in 19 years Mm -hmm. uh, between the trilogies? And I think that a lot of fans have discussed, like, it's not so much that people forgot the Jedi is that do not speak of them (laughs) do not Mm. think about them under pain of of horror and it was really powerful to see that literal conversation of like that kid's cursed gifted if you know what i mean 
was mm-hmm. really powerful to me. It's absolutely going to be in our theme conversation, and, and Jen, definitely want your perspective on this one to, to kind of maybe end this uh, swing through this part of the story before we dive in. But it was it was one of my favorite scenes for a lot of the reasons you're talking about, Joseph. It, it, it's that that's a tr- until this moment, it's a trivia answer, right? Mm-hmm. It's a well, you know what Palpatine did? He took it. You know what Cad Bane did a lot? It, and it's a and it's a, almost a fun Star Wars lore answer to see it. And feel it on this level. I was going through some uh, personal. I had, in the tra- one of the last things that happened before I traveled is my little dog, uh, Franny, like came out and, and and was panicked that I was leaving at three in the morning and hmm. barked and cried. And then they, if it had been a Rodian family that had opened that scene, but it was the most pet like looking cute face mom and, and kid that I was just like, uh, uh, I didn't want to leave my chihuahua. Like, what is my chihuahua going to do without me? And I just was like, I, I, it, the whole scene, but, but all that comedy aside is exactly what you're describing, Joseph. It, it was, it was, Hey, that little, that little wrinkle of star Wars storyline, we're going to, we're going to make you feel it and understand how horrible it was. Yeah, truly. That's yeah. The tour of the Imperial era of like, it, it's awful, uh, and you see that mm-hmm. in lots of ways. Uh, last big picture thing I'll say is I, I, I do think it is, these two episodes are triumph for toy lovers. There's lots of stuff about how great toys are <laughs> and how important, so I felt validated. Um, <laughs> all right, let's get into some of the uh, big picture <laughs> ideas, the, the, the big themes. Um, I want to throw this out there to, to both of you. I think there's a lot of different ways to look at it. Um, it, it these episodes are obviously about vulnerability and in, in people trotting on the innocent. But I thought what really connected them was this idea of the strength uh, it takes to be a protector of others. Like we, we look at these episodes and we see these things that we value of home and family and community, and they're being trampled by the empire in lots and lots of different ways. But if you put the episodes together, um, they're, to me, they're studying a con- in the contrast or maybe growing together of Emery and Omega. The first episode is really all about Emery struggling to be there for the innocent, for children, to protect them. And the big finale of this quiet, haunting episode is Emery making a massive emotional uh, and heroic breakthrough by giving a child a small handmade toy and moving herself closer to Omega. In the second episode, there's a lot that I want to talk about of, of Omega's growth and Omega truly be coming an adult but omega is so far down the journey from what we just saw with emery of omega has no doubt that she must protect and rescue the innocent that she has to be there for the people of pabu that she has to be there for all of her clone family on tantis uh you know that that great scene with crosshair where she's really saying like i i have to i have to give up i have to give myself over i have to sacrifice Myself, for now, I can't let the people here suffer more because of me. We've been looking for a way to find our brothers. Um, There's all sorts of stuff going on in both episodes. But to me, when I was really trying to boil it down, it was the first episode is Emery struggling to to decide if she can and should be there for the children, if she has the bravery to be there for the children. And Omega having no doubt that it is her job, it is a human's job to be there for the community. Jennifer, does that make sense to you? And and if so, how do you feel about it? I like that. I saw it that the children are really the ones helping the adults in Mm. both both episodes. It's the kids who are stirring this and kind of awakening for Emery, her empathy and, you know, willingness to connect. And obviously with Crosshair uh, and Omega, she's like, no, I, I can do this. I'm okay. Like, Sorry, Dad. I gotta go do. Like, I go do this. Right. Yeah. It's time for me to leave and fulfill this part of the mission. Um, yeah. And I thought that that is really great, and it's great for kids to be able to see that. That hey, they're the ones that are making this change, and they're the ones that have the power in both episodes. I think that's a really great, a great way to look at it. Yeah, because I think uh, I was uh, really looking at it of, of these sort of in internal realities of Emery and Omega. But you're right that what's pushing them to make those choices is the children and Omega being the child on the way to adulthood <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah, and being more of an adult than, uh, than Crosshair, I think of like, mm-hmm. there's some great stuff there of, uh, I love her line about, um, think of the bigger mission because Crosshair has been on this journey yeah. to become closer to Omega. And she's basically saying like, it can't just be about me. You've learned to care about me, but now you need to care about 
everybody, all the clones, all the people on Pabu. I'm only a part of it. You can't. It's great that you've had this emotional awakening crosshair, but it can't be just only about me. You can't love me and still just be an a-hole to the entire rest of the galaxy. <laughs> That's not going to work. Uh, Ken, how do you feel about these uh, big picture ideas of uh, the children yeah. leading the way to the adults making a better choice? It's 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 the center of, of of Star Wars. It's the center of our discussions. Uh, look to the next generations and look what they can give back to you, and look where they're leading, and then follow it. And that includes just the Star Wars fandom itself. Um, even on my trip this weekend, dealt with some warm, wonderful folks who just have this ah, new Star Wars sucks, right? Kind of vibe, and and that might be more your opinion, but but look beyond it. Look to the people coming beyond behind you. Look at the ones who this is their stories, and there should be your stories as well. I think if you find a way to engage with them, I think a lot of that's present with what you're talking about, Jen, and the the children. The children are their future. Teach them well. Let them lead the way, as we've said <laughs> before, even here. Um, <laughs> And and just what you're talking about too, yeah. I I I, I think it was o almost the benefit of of maybe having an idea of what was going to happen at the end of the second episode with Omega, mm -hmm. watching Emery go through what she's going through, and thinking when they meet up again, well, that's going to be an entirely different vibe, and and uh, even more important. And and what is Omega going to give to Emery? What is she going to teach Emery? What's Emery? Where's Emery going to be at the end of this episode ten? I hadn't even finished the episode yet, but I was thinking about them. Uh, they're obviously connected, and it was this again uh, a, a trivia question or a, an answer of, of lore that's forthcoming. What's the connection when season two ends? Emery and Omega and uh, sister, you know, clone, whatever it might be, and it's going beyond that to something more important. And and there, the, to in, in conjunction with your themes, and, and we talk about this tour of the Empire uh, during this era. I really think this episode titled "Identity Crisis" deals with how much. Um, you know, how many how many people have to hide and suppress who they are and how those around them can't even uh, let them live their lives out loud and in the public and your identity must be uh, uh, suppressed. That's part of the suppression. This is a boot of the empire episode. The idea, the image of the empire showing up on Pabu was mm -hmm. one of those uh, oppressive boot moments we've talked about before here. And and that leading to this big thing with Emery, I was really drawn to how they played it out of of. I looked at, at kind of discovering the core of the path you're on uh, and, and analyzing your choices and maybe who you thought you were, that being part of the identity crisis that sometimes happens. I think Emery is as a product of her environment. She she might be a product of science in a way. You know, she's just – she was bored and put in this world to be something and, and she's on the imperial path and – and not question anything. We saw she's just gr a great worker. At the beginning of the episode, she's kind of summarizing what we've seen before. I'm, I'm pretty good at this. Why don't I do it? And then, and then it, the truth of who uh, uh, who she's associated with, the truth of the path she's on, uh, is leading her to a, a great change in this triumphant moment of a toy, as, as you so uh, well said. So, um, yeah, loved all that there. A lot to dive into, even more. Yeah, and I think um, there's been this big question of who Emery is in terms of like you're saying yeah lore of what, what what's her backstory which we got a little hint of mm -hmm. um but that you know beat at the end of season two of I'm your sister and, and it's a little been yeah. been soft played of what does that mean how is that going to play out and I think it was great to spend quality time with her but also see uh Jennifer to your point of the the children leading the way that it it, it is Omega's victory uh, of getting through to Emery. I, I love that they that the show took the time for Emery to be doing her science and to look through her data pad and look at that picture of Omega. And like when I'm first watching it, I'm kind of thinking like, is she going to have some epiphany about the science of it? But I love that it was just a total emotional moment of just looking at this picture of Omega and remembering how much Omega fought for that little bit of humanity. Mm -hmm. and that's what gives Emery the idea to give the toy. So it is uh, Omega instructing Emery uh, to your point, which I think is, is great. Um, but another key quote that I really thought was powerful in the, these episodes was uh, Emery saying to Nala say, Nala say says, you need to watch after the, the specimens, the children now. And uh, Emery saying, there's nothing I can do. I don't have that kind of power. And, and Nala say says, don't you? Um, and we can talk if that's like a, oh, is she force sensitive too? And <laughs> all that. But I felt like to me, the emotional impact of it was uh, this classic Star Wars idea of we all have a choice always. And even if you can't go running out and, you know, I don't think uh, that Emery does have the power to go 
hit the big red button on Mount Tantus that says, blow it up, end it, yeah. stop yeah. everything, right? She, she probably doesn't have the power to just stop everything. Mm -hmm. But she has this little human power of mm -hmm. symbolically and literally treating the specimens as humans, as children. Uh, Jennifer, how do you feel about that idea that maybe we can't defeat the the entire system of horror, but we always have the power to have a little humanity within that system, and maybe that can make a difference? That's what I was so impressed by with this episode was considering that this is animated and you know a certain amount of t time that we get to spend with these characters, and they just let her kind of come to this realization slowly. It was how any of us might react in that situation if we were in that situation, like, hey, they're kids. We don't have to, we don't have to be so cold. It was just like kind of peppered in in a very natural and organic way, so that it doesn't feel like ham-handed when she finally does give the doll right mm -hmm. i thought that that was just so well done um and it just it made me i don't want to say identify but it just felt a little bit more relatable to her to her journey and see yeah. and it's like oh i knew it i knew she wasn't all bad and that's what i think is so great about this show is that they're they're not dealing with black and white right like good guys bad guys it's really like this gradient of 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 Gr I don't want to say gray, but you know what I mean. Like seeing different colors within these characters, that they're not all bad. She's in a bad situation, but she does have the power to make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. To, to have the empathy to see that she is trapped in a massive system. Mm -hmm. And also just in, in a very short, elegant way that I'd love to talk about, we get a little sense of maybe what happened to her, which I think also gives her some empathy. So she's, she's talking to Nala say, uh, and, saying they're children like i was was mm. your plan to discard them too that for me was like a ah oh, i've been waiting <laughs> mm -hmm. for a little hint of how did emery end up where she is in sort of buying into the just be a good worker bee show everyone how skilled you are at science and mm -hmm. that's the way to acceptance um ken how did you feel about that little hint of backstory for her uh, both emotionally and from a honestly like storytelling like who is she? What's the story perspective? Yeah, it makes sense there, too. There's so many uh, wonderful mysteries to explore on the ghosts of Camino that we'll get to, uh, <laughs> but it, how it tied into the episode. And and I'll say that, the, the, you know, I'll say humanity, but species manity whatever, <laughs> in the galaxy, <laughs> but humanity, for lack of a better term, like, like the victory of this episode was preserving a little bit of the identity of these quote unquote specimens. That was the big choice because that might not have been what she got or maybe she felt she couldn't. And again, she gets thrown into this cog, how the details still forthcoming, but she's thrown into a cog. You're right. She can't press the destruct button. There is no big red uh, in this all uh, situation. And, and the conversation uh, spoke to me too of that you put it down. There's nothing I can do. I don't have that kind of power. But the question before that is what will you do, Emery? And what a big Star Wars question. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's it's what will you do? And this the 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 victory being this little sliver of again what I'll say humanity for the specimens for uh, their soul. A little bit of of I I will acknowledge that you are more than a number, and that is the victory today. That is the spark <laughs> that will light the rebellion. Uh, that is the kind of thing that Star Wars uh, hits on time and time again. And I, and to tie it back to again what might be her beginning. How mm -hmm. she feels, and it probably is correct. I was tossed aside. Yeah, you know? tossed aside. I I liked it because it gave me empathy for her. Of like, she was just yeah. you know put in this given to the emperor or empire rather mm -hmm. by the Caminoans. It mm -hmm. would seem like with the, was I discarded too? Some deal of like, man, look at look at our clones have lots of value. We're we're, we're working on a new model. <laughs> they're, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're smarter than the boys. Uh, take. Take a scientist clone. Um, it, it gave me a lot of, you know, empathy for Emery and understanding, you know, sort of that pain often does lead to maybe not making great decisions or not questioning uh, the systems you're trapped in. But also made me think that there is growth with Nalase. If Nalase was yeah. all in, taking the <laughs> money from the Empire, handed mm -hmm. over Emery, and and I know different people have different amounts uh, of different opinions about this. But I think there's this great contrast where uh, Hemlock is certain that Nala Se has been protecting Omega because she's has scientific value. Mm -hmm. And I, 
I have feel like the storytelling is not to say is aware that Omega will become a target because of her scientific value, but mm -hmm. Omega's value to Nala say has become personal, which to me sort of implies emotional growth from Nala say that mm -hmm. maybe she did discard Emery years back, but she doesn't want to discard Omega and she wants to protect the kids there. Jennifer, how do you feel about um, Emery's backstory and all that? I thought it was really well done because then it makes all of her choices prior to this episode make sense. It's why we see those little those little flickers of empathy or even like her ability to connect to Omega. It's like, oh, that's why. And then really seeing these kids in this situation, it was really upsetting. Mm -hmm. and, and it's so fascinating because we, we know that the Jedi – took kids right and we've always been like oh i've i've always wondered well what's that like and do they miss their families and here was the exact opposite and <laughs> and it was as horrifying as i would imagine when she says when are we go when am i going home i want to go home oh my gosh and just seeing them like just like looking so sad oh my I, I, the animators <laughs> They really, they really did an incredible job. Yeah. There, yeah. There was, there was one shot of, of uh, Eva um, where she was kind of playing, but was really bored by the game and listless and her little legs were kicking. And it was just like, like the animators went and like, uh, let's add uh, 10 more percent to the sadness filter. Let's just kick <laughs> that up several more details. notches. <laughs> yes, details. Oh yeah. my gosh. Uh, I, I did also like, I think, um, once I really thought about both episodes as these sort of choices to help and protect others, that there is so much of protecting others laced throughout that second episode with, without thinking uh, we don't get much record, but record jokes uh, with Gonky about leaving him behind. And as soon as he sees an explosion grabs Gonky, Gonky has value. He's part of the squad without question. Uh, there's, there's protection from record. We got um, Batcher like, running in because he has to protect families all of our hero heroes you know obviously the main characters are doing everything they can to protect omega and protect pabu there's in contrast to the horror and the sadness of that first episode it, there's so much of protecting uh others in in, in the, the second episode how did that hit you ken I, I, I love how, how you broke it down there. I think it absolutely is present. And these, these episodes are two, two wonderful bookends. Uh, no wonder they connected them. It makes sense. And it always does. Every time there's a two-parter, you're like, oh, okay. That, that's why I had extra time to watch. The, that's why I had to make extra time to watch two episodes this week. It works so well together. I absolutely uh, think it's present. It was uh, The, the record-saving gonky moment was absolutely one of my favorite things for a lot of reasons. Um but you see everyone uh, needing to save, trying to save. The questions about how do you save, what really saves. I think it comes down to the Omega Crosshair thing. I think Crosshair's, you know, still on a journey. Um, but, you know, you got Hunter uh, uh, trying, even in failing. There's just a lot of great efforts to preserve, save, protect. Uh, even the idea of, of we'll, get it, we'll shed a tear, the tech goggles. Is about preserving and saving memories and legacy and, and, and on those those kind of levels. Yeah, no, absolutely powerful. Uh, Jennifer, did you feel uh, heartened at all amidst the horror by all the all our heroes in, in Pabu trying to protect one another? Or were you just a wash in horror? Uh, yeah, I was. I was like, "Don't kill my gonkey! Don't kill my bachelor! <laughs> you better keep Wrecker alive. This is not his time to go." Like, I, I was just getting uh, on the edge of my seat, wondering, "Is this going to be?" Because you know, that's the thing with Bad Batch. You don't know when they mm -hmm. took out my tech. I, I was like, "Well, anything's for anyone, and anything and anyone is fair game." This show is not afraid to ramp it up. And and make us uh, feel emotional and and miss our heroes. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, I I loved it, and I also was terrified at what yeah. was going to happen. It gave it a yeah. lot of great great tension to to mm -hmm. feel like I don't think yeah this doesn't seem like a, a big enough moment for Wrecker, but like when he came out, I kind of expected him to like you know shake it off and go oh man <laughs> like, he's out he's out uh, so oh. great so great oh. watching Omega be stripped of her protectors and. You know, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about was um, in both of these episodes, I feel like there we spend a lot of time with the villains and we get a little bit of villain perspective, not even from an 
empathy perspective. I don't mean it that way. There's a lot of just plot mechanics, but I was really affected by how much we were seeing what is motivating the bad guys. And I think it's mm -hmm. kind of classic Star Wars stuff. But these are both episodes about, you know, innocence, families, children's community being brutalized. So it, it made me think about the why. And a lot of the villains did have like a little moment where you're reminded that it is it's greed. Mm. It's a lust for power. It's uh, it's ego. It was a little trip of why this brutalization is, is happening and dehumanization. Um, Cad Cad Bane, uh, you know, is uh, put across as one, you know, the baddest bounty hunter of this era. And in Clone Wars, we've seen him do like impressive things. He fights off Kenobi and Quinlan Voss. It's kind of this thing in, in, in this episode, in this arc, where he's, you know, a class one bounty hunter. Only class mm. ones can go after these incredibly <laughs> sensitive targets. And he's got the, uh, uh, Emery asks him how many, um, you know, specimens he's got. And he's just, he, he, like this, he's got. And he's just like, let's just say I'm good at my job. And then you watch what he did. Like, oh, big man, <laughs> you, you stunned a, a defenseless parent at their door and kidnapped a baby. Big effing man. I was really affected by seeing how much his ego is caught up in the big jobs, but there was nothing to be proud of. It was just empty ego. Uh, Ken, did you have any Cad Bane thoughts or reactions? I loved the use of him here because I thought it was, in, in the end, all I might need from him in this season. There's mm -hmm. thoughts of, you know, do we get him and Boba? I, I, mm -hmm. There's still a Boba factor that hangs over some of this show for me, meaning I'm just like, I'm just curious. The, is there is there ever going to be a time where the idea of Omega and Boba Fett and uh, Emery, are, are we ever mm -hmm. going to have more with that? I don't know. Might not be this show. I don't know if it's 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 needed as much anymore where they're gone with the season because of the stuff with Cat Bane. Yeah, he is, um, he is uh, fear-inducing. We've seen that both now, mm -hmm. live action animation. But uh, what is he actually doing? I love that. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 you didn't even pick up the baby. You bullied your droid into doing it, too. <laughs> he did um, yeah. next to nothing. Next yeah. to nothing. Uh, but, but we also get the uh, the shot of the, the Aqualish getting the credits kind of thrown at him by mm. Cat Bane and being really reminded that this cruelty is for a small amount of, of money. Mm. Um, yeah. Cat Bane motivated by money and ego. Uh, we, we get that Tarkin scene which is just, uh, I think, about political machinations and moving the mm -hmm. plot forward and hinting at, maybe this is why Project Necromancer falls apart uh, as well, because Tarkin's not on mm -hmm. board. But I also felt like it was great to spend a little bit of time again with Hemlock and remember that for him, this is all about ego. He wants to please the Emperor. He wants to take over all of the Imperial Science Division, and he's jockeying for position, you mm -hmm. know, with with Tarkin was a reminder that that's what this is about for him is ego and power and station. Uh, there's the little reminder for um, CX2 uh, that he is being uh, uh, led around by the nose about ego too. Hemlock manipulates him by saying like, you know, do, do you need mm -hmm. the, the other troops I'm working on aren't, aren't ready to help you. And CX2 is like, I can handle it on my own. And Hemlock says, can you, you've already failed once. So there's a lot of that. Like none of these, none of these villains are, they're doing it because they're twirling their mustaches and have black capes like in a British panto. Mm -hmm. They're all in this classic Star Wars way, so sadly motivated by greed and ego and jockeying for position within their society. Ken, mm -hmm. how do you feel about being reminded that, that they're not just doing it because they're bad, but that they all have these human motivations that we are all susceptible to for the yeah. horrific things they're doing in these episodes? Well, yeah, Jen, you said, you know, we got uh, the, 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 this gradient. Uh, gray is a term often, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. not, not even misused. It's just, I don't know. It's yeah. a third category that I don't think exists. I think it's often the journey between the dark and the light, the good and the bad. Mm. Your choices in the end do put you on a side. And there's, mm -hmm. I think, two choices there. With Star Wars, it's light and dark. Uh but the journey there is based on things like you're talking about, Joseph. It is, it is this, this fear. It's Krennic going, I need to be three rows up in the meeting. 
Uh, mm. It is it is Iken to it. Uh, it is uh, I just I just rewatched Barbie on the plate. It is the you are not just your accomplishments. You're more than that. You you mm. could be Knuff too, CX two, if you just pay attention. <laughs> See what you, you might got be it. eventually. Yeah, uh, I love <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah. You are Tech Nuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you are Tech Nuff. You are Tech Nuff. Uh, <laughs> and, and and it's that's very human things. How many times have we said over the years? I know it's one of my favorite moments. That's why I mentioned a lot of just this revelation that we got was it during Alphabet Squadron that that. You you know, the em- the emperor himself was tracking so many things because if you lied on an invoice, he wanted you on your team, on his team, because mm. you had some moral gray area that was going to allow him to push you towards a decision that would benefit him and his side. So yeah, uh, uh, the gr- the gradient is is Jed. You 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 coined this phrase for us now. The gradient <laughs> is where we're living, and it is stuff like this. We're even the big bad bounty hunters, uh, or the guy who spied and and, and reported this for for sensitive kid. Oh, big, big, big man there. And you, you're you hiding while Cad Bane throws some cash at you. You couldn't even come out. Yeah, it's it's, it's yeah. there. Big Aqualish. Uh, <laughs> Jennifer, how, how did you feel about about seeing the, those very sadly relatable human emotions behind all the horror? I just want to say that I loved how they used the cameos. I, I don't want to say cameos, but characters that we already know. Because I think... We knew that Cad Bane was going to be here, right? I can't mm-hmm. remember. Mm-hmm. When he appeared, I was yeah, like, he was trailer, oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah, I was like, yeah. oh, that's right. He's here. He was used so well. And it was a different side of him. I don't want to say different side. It, it was a different look to him in that he seemed bored. He seemed like he was not fulfilled. It was his body <laughs> posture. Well, while his droid was going and doing the deal and everything, he was like on that you know little machine like fiddling with it. He, he wasn't was just even checking in- Instagram. He was yeah, checking that's Instagram. what it looked like. This is what it looked like. He wasn't even <laughs> like, engaged. Is right? there any bounties that aren't <laughs> babies? Any non-baby <laughs> bounties for me to prove myself. You know, it's like when you're in a, in a rideshare car, the driver's getting other rides where you enter. You're like, hey, I'm here. Talk to me. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he was so cold and it was so cruel. And it was just, and then when he like throws the money, I was like, oh, he is horrible. He's a horrible, like, I don't know. I guess I kind of liked him before. Now I really don't like him. (laughs) He has been pushed to the bad. Uh, Like you said, Ken, that is a great, great way to put it because eventually they do have to choose a side. It it was interesting. I mean, it was interesting to get a little bit more perspective from him in Book of Boba Fett where he is priding himself on. He's he's one of the kind of these kind of classic like there isn't hope in the world. Everyone is brutal. And if that is the reality, uh, if, if you're a sucker to believe in hope and community, it's just everybody is out for number one. Then there's no there's nothing wrong about being the best at being out for number one. And he so wants mm-hmm. Boba Fett to admit that that's the truth of the world and that that's who Boba Fett is. In a lot of ways, that's like the most perspective we get from Cad Bane. And it mm-hmm. seems like that is is here in this episode, too. If he's just like kind of boring to just you know kidnap babies i used to break into the jedi temple and steal holocrons <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> you know yeah. kind of kind of boring but there's still this pride to me in that mm. i see the galaxy the way it is is everybody's out for number one and he gives mm-hmm. that little poke to emory of like you you reveal a lot more than you think asking questions like that yeah. like he thinks yeah. he's so much better than her mm-hmm. because he's so good at being cold and distant in number one mm-hmm. yes yeah it's yep. sad as if to yeah, say, exactly. you know, how, you know, you keep asking questions like that. People are going to think you have a heart and you care. Yeah. <laughs> you have hope and you're connected. Yeah. yeah. Stop that. Um, I also thought there was a, a nice, uh, nice is the wrong word. There, there was very clear stuff in that first episode about terminology. Lots of, you know, very traditional Star Wars, you know, mechanical versus the the flowing inorganic of mm-hmm. they don't, they don't have names. Don't hang out with them. They're their numbers uh there's a lot of th- they're not children they are specimens they're scientific assets uh on pabu cx2 keeps using the term fugitive for omega mm-hmm. and that was also uh, i think well done in in sad because i think it is a very real world thing of mm-hmm. um if you are perpetrating cruelty if you label everybody else with you know a different label than human or they're the ro- it, omega's a fugitive so what mm-hmm. I'm doing is just justice and what you're mm-hmm. doing harboring around this island is, is criminality that um, that need to dehumanize your targets. So you're not the one doing the cruel thing was was really evident in these episodes and sad. Anybody mm-hmm. want to talk about that? <laughs> 
<laughs> there was uh, an agency I used to work uh, with pretty closely. Uh, they have guns and badges, and there's a famous, infamous saying uh, called uh, NHI, and it is called No Humans Involved, and it would be said at crime scenes. Uh, wow. So, uh, I uh, knew, I, you know, you, you joke because yeah. it's just that's how it was. was. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I think there's some truth in that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Oof. Oof. yeah, it's really hard. Any, any, uh, anything you want to uh, talk about with that, Jennifer, or should we move on? <laughs> yeah. Make it light and fluffy, Jen. Make it light oh and fluffy. Oh my gosh! I, I'm sorry, wow. I don't have little toys to make it better right now. Here, take toys. I know. I need. Yeah. I need my Duka doll. Uh, yeah. No, I don't. Wow, I'm gonna marinate on that for a while. Yeah. Um. Well, to bring it up a notch, I want to talk quickly about the loss of home and comfort. Uh, I, I did <laughs> something lighter. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, no, I did. I mean, the the toys were really humanizing, but I, I did like the focus on we're seeing all this cruelty, but we need to be reminded of of what what is essentially valuable to to beings, to to humans, to community, which is this idea of home. The kids talk about wanting to go home. Omega mentions that Pabo is the only place that ever felt like home. Uh, the the their ship, the Havoc Marauder, being destroyed. They didn't linger on it, um, but the 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 show has really positioned the Havoc Marauder as home to home. Omega. So she lost two homes this episode in mm -hmm. Pabu in that ship. So there's there's all this stuff about home uh, uh, being the goal uh, and the tragedy being the loss of it. Uh, and there's also, I think, obviously a lot of great stuff with the, the value of toys uh, that that uh, the the little guy, the baby uh, Baron's toy oh. is, you know, the catalyst for all of this. Uh, the the victory is Omega's makeshift Lula. Um, mm -hmm. Her leaving Omega being willing to, to leave behind the original Lula that started out, if I remember correctly, as Wrecker's toy that mm -hmm. made their cold barracks on Camino feel like home. And there's some mm -hmm. stuff early on where, where Wrecker's kind of like, yeah, it's just our barracks in a science, you know, installation, but it was our home. And we wrote our, you know, victories on the wall and we had Lula. So Lula's always been this symbol of, of home. Uh, Ken, how did you feel about what the episodes had to say about uh, home, comfort, toys, the things that make us human? Yeah, well, first of all, I'm glad I didn't buy a Murado Lego set and start to build it like I did the Razor Crest <laughs> studio I bought the right. weekend. Uh, and, and I know you contributed to the bigger campaign for the Razor Crest, and then got, we all yeah. watched it die. I'm just oh, not getting no. attached to ships in modern Star Wars. <laughs> just, just, as soon as they introduce me to a cool ship, I'm going to be like, well, bye. Well, yeah. it's and it's big. And it, look, you could rebuild anything in Star Wars. Sure, there could be the Marauder too, whatever. But like, it, I I had a little bit of a oh my god, uh, and and it, a lot of it is, is is how it's been framed. You're absolutely right. It is a traveling home. Uh, it takes her to Pabu. There's so much to happen on there. Going back to the beginning uh, of this series, it, it, you know there that. It was only, when they walked into their barracks in like the pilot episode of this. It had a sitcom vibe. Like I was like, "Oh, this is going to be one of the six locations on the sitcom that we're always going to go to, right?" <laughs> like Cheers right. back room, Sam's yeah. office here, yeah. and and uh, it is about um, you know uh, finding those those things that are are you. I think that's if you're a fan like us, and over the, no matter when you started loving Star Wars, that part of it is the collecting, part of it is the toys, and you can make fun of it. It can be jokes, and yes, uh, folks like Joseph and I can be uh, you know battling kids in a toy aisle for uh, Star Wars figures, and we always let them win. But um, it, that's that's who you are. It represents you. It's so powerful because it, it it just it, it's it's something on a shelf that says that's me. This is a part of me. And, and that's part of what makes things home. But that's why we put pictures up. That's why we have, you know, that couch you love, all those things. And and, and uh, I, I love the way it's played out in this show time and time again. And these little tiny things are mean so much. The humanity, the species yeah. manity of it. Yeah. <laughs> how did you feel, Jennifer, about, uh, you know, the episodes focusing on home and, and how much toys were such an important through line? I loved it because with babies, you know, one of the things that they recommend is you give them a lovey, like a little toy attached to a little blanket. And mm. it's to basically provide comfort and to soothe, uh, help the baby when you are oh, the mom or dad is away, right? So seeing the toys used to bring comfort and then Omega finally feeling like she's now at the age 
which happens with a lot of kids, right? They were, they're like, no, I'm okay. I don't need my little lovey anymore. I'm going to leave it here. But also mm -hmm. that she finally feels comfortable enough to put down roots in some sense, right? Like mm -hmm. she's like, this is Pabu's going to mm. be my home, whatever. So I just thought that that was so beautiful. And I just want to say, speaking of toys, the little baby, I don't know what, is it Baron? You called him Baron? Baron, B-A-Y-E-R-N, I believe, yeah. Baron, he was making all those cooing sounds, and one of the sounds was a sound that the that Grogu, a Grogu toy that I have, makes. It's a it's a little Grogu toy, and I was like, oh, that's the sound that I have. I have that toy, <laughs> and I just love that they incorporated that detail into his uh, little coos. Oh my mm. gosh! Yeah, mm. it was it was so great and and so relatable. Like I I think I got a lot of comfort as a kid from from toys, and I think I have like powerful memories of what you're describing. I'm sure a, a lot of people do. Um, mm. But I remember like just, I like, I still like stuffed animals as, as even by like second and third grade, I already had the, the hard asses on the playground. Like I'm bad. I don't need stuffed animals anymore. And I was kind of like, I do. I want them. Um, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure that it's a part of the psychology that has led me to be a toy collector and want to advocate for the, the symbolic power of them and all that. So it, uh, that relationship being presented in such a powerful way was, was, it was affecting to me. Um, mm -hmm. And I love what you're saying about, about Omega growing and saying, I don't need Lula, but also respecting the sort of, um, the symbolic power of that doll mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. it was Wreckers. Wrecker gave it to me. I needed something like it. So I made a makeshift version of it. She doesn't even know that makeshift version of it is now giving comfort to another child. Mm -hmm. And that kindness and that comfort is being passed on and on. I love that she wasn't just like the Star Wars version of, I don't need Lula. <laughs> uh, right. sell, her, oh, no. <laughs> sell her at the garage sale, right? It was, right. I'm going to leave Lula here among the treasures mm -hmm. of Pabu because yeah. that's how important she is. I can get by without her, but I don't for a second diminish her incredible importance and value. That was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, well said. Yeah. The connection from, from the moment with Emery to that. Yeah. It's, it's strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Great stuff. A uh, final little thing I want to talk about is, is we've kind of been tracking through throughout the, uh, this season of uh, the kind of the, the twilight of, of the bad batch of, you know, Omega really growing into an adult and, Wrecker, Hunter, and Crosshair kind of slowing down in lots of different ways, um, and just mm. not racking up a lot of wins really. Mm. And they're stripped; they're slowly stripped away in this episode. Wrecker is knocked out by the explosion. Hunter fails in doing the cool, yep, mm -hmm. steal the the ship. Um, Crosshair, we got to talk about that shot. That that's an all time shot of that tracker missing the ship. Um, mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. that is that setting up Omega's journey. Mm -hmm. I think it is about sort of like the truth that we all fade a bit in our abilities as we age, like mm -hmm. that, that tracker missing. I know the ship is taken off and all that, but it is like, that's, that's the <laughs> older generation <laughs> slowing down. <laughs> yeah. That one shot. Um, Ken, did you, were you expecting Crosshair to make the shot? Were you yeah, I was. That by the thing falling into the ocean? I, I I think as it, as it fell, <laughs> as, whoo, I think I wasn't shocked as so much as just kind of reminded, even on a on a an emotional emotional surface level, what you're talking about on a deeper level of of yeah 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 that we all fade away. <laughs> it, it's all it all happens. Hell, I was I was at the one of the if not the last inning of Dodger great Oral Hershiser's career. He was oh, like forty wow. forty one. He started a game. And I think he got two outs, and he proceeded to hit like two or three batters and couldn't get the ball 50 feet. <sighs> and an entire stadium went, oh, my God, it's oh, done. It's no. done. And and I think it's the reality of, of life. And to have Crosshair, it's, I'm saying it as a comedy beat, but it's just like, oh, there's a, <laughs> there's has, now there has to be another way to do this, right? Now it, it, it's, it can't just be my strength, my skills. I'm a good soldier. I follow orders and I'm the best of the best of the best. The best. It, it, that ain't what it is anymore. And you're going to have to find another way. You're going to find other people. And that's part of we talk about change. We talk about generational mm -hmm. change. That's that's at play in Star Wars a lot. Yeah, yeah. and involve and use different skills and yeah, it is powerful. How did you feel about that shot, Jennifer? Did you expect Crosshair to make the the shot with the tracker? I I did. And and I think that's what made me so uh, 
uneasy the entire episode was kind of seeing all of our heroes, which I was like, oh, they're, of course, they're going to get out of this situation. It's not going to be a problem, but they are fading. And it mm. just was like a reminder, especially with Omega's uh, uh, conversation with Crosshair. It's very much like as we get older with our parents or our caregivers and they just, they're, they're losing it or they can't do the things that they used to do. And we, and for me personally, it's like, you look to that person as like, you're, you know, steering the ship, right? Steering the family. And now suddenly I have to st say, you know, parent, step aside. I'm going to steer the ship. I know what's best. And let me tell you, parents don't like to hear that <laughs> even in their <laughs> older age, right? Even in their older age. But at some point that has to happen. And so seeing Omega doing the right thing and finally saying, look, let me take over. <sighs> that was really powerful. Mm -hmm. It was really powerful. And it, it, and it, it, I didn't feel like Crosshair let her down, right? Or it, it, no. and it was that like he fought off the troopers. He did a great job. The ship, you know, it, it wasn't that he missed the shot, right? The ship just started to leave and he was a second too yeah. late, right? So, yeah. I mean, yeah. we're talking about the sort of diminishment. It, it isn't like he's just like, yeah, she trusted yeah. him and he goofed <laughs> it because he's like, right, exactly. you know, right? Right. It's subtle. Like, yeah. It's subtle. Yeah. You know, I, it, I love that it just felt like she was like, this is the be best plan we got. It's not perfect. We don't have time for another one, but we can't do nothing. Let's mm -hmm. go. It, there was no sense to me of of crosshair letting her down. It was just like that didn't work. We'll find another way. Um, yeah. Which I, I want to ask you both about that the final moment. Um, Omega's on the ship. Uh, she she takes that deep calming breath. Uh, people uh, tweeted us questions about it. <laughs> uh, accidentally telling Ken how the episode ends. Um, it happens. Uh, mm. I. I think uh, I, I can sometimes, I think, be dangerously optimistic and, and cling to the, the hopeful moments. But I found such hope and power in that moment because I think after watching, you know, an hour of children in communities in the innocent be brutalized mm -hmm. to see this image of Omega definitely in danger, uh, definitely not in full control but emotionally entirely in control. And the, what I was left with is almost fist pumping at the idea of the last time she went to Tantis, she was a child and a prisoner. And now mm. she is going on purpose as a liberator. Mm. It's, mm -hmm. it's overstating mm -hmm. to say it's her choice to go uh, because all these forces were there to take her, but she has her head so screwed on straight of, I need to do this to save Pabu. I need to do this to potentially save all the clones there. I know the situation I'm going into and I know what I need to do. And that breath, whether it's connecting mm -hmm. with the force or whether it's just this deep breath of life's not easy. It's not perfect. I have a really hard thing to do in front of me, but I'm just going to take a deep breath and I'm going to absolutely do my best in this bad situation. If it's the force or if it's just a young girl, collecting herself for a hard task ahead it, it was incredibly powerful deep breath to me uh jennifer how did you feel about that moment i loved it at first i did think i was like oh connecting with the force but it almost felt like a sigh like a relief like finally she's been running everyone's been trying to protect her and she's finally like no now is the time I'm ready. I am at peace with this decision I've made. And I was like, wow, that's, she's grown up so much grown up before our eyes and it's going to be terrifying, but she is mentally prepared. A wonderful reminder for, <laughs> for me, take that <laughs> breath, collect yourself before doing mm -hmm. something hard. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Ken, what did you feel about that moment? Yeah. I, I it, look, we, we could get the answer of whether or not, She's force sensitive, all the stuff. I thought we got a little bit more of um, an explanation of why they, you know, her, her blood being a binder for M counts, all, yeah, kind of, yeah. all that kind of mm -hmm, stuff mm -hmm. may soon come. I, so I definitely didn't take it as, as force related at all, but I can see, like, Jen, how, how you would feel that in the moment. It's a very, we've seen Jedi do that before, right? <laughs> but, I, but I think it is connecting. It's, it's, it's a both feet on the ground. It is it is put your feet on the ground and be present in this moment. This is where we're at. It does not mean it's 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 bravery, it's courage, but it doesn't mean she doesn't have fear, doesn't have doubts. All those things of course uh we know are still present, but I I I, I not I'm 
it's not like wasn't like a resignation, but it was just like, yeah, I, this is what I needed to do. Because remember, this, she's been wanting to turn back from from the start of the season. Mm-hmm. Like, I only got Batcher, and I only got Crosshair. That's not enough. It's not enough. I want to go back. And whether or not she feels she's going to be successful or not, she knows she she has to be here. She wants to be here. She needs to be here. Um, and and I think that's what I took the the breath out. It doesn't mean you know. Doesn't mean you're not afraid. Absolutely not. We all have fear. That's the thing. Everyone has fear. This episode shows a lot of fears that we discussed earlier. What do you choose to do with that fear? Uh, I think is is how how you how you move forward best on this path towards the light, away from the dark. And she's doing it. And I love the breath. I love the moment. I think you're right, Joseph, to have um, hope for hope. Awesome. Eh, that, I feel validated. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I think what, to me what was powerful about it uh, as well is, yeah, I think she might be force sensitive, and I think we might move up to some, you mm-hmm. know, amazing moment where she she pushes a button from across the room and it saves the day, you know, with the force kind of thing, uh, maybe. But it, it it is it is Jedi stuff because she learned it from a Jedi. She learned it yes. from Gungi, and it was one of those moments where. I love the fantasy of Star Wars, and I love that the story is the Jedi have literal power. They're space wizards. But Mm -hmm. it's also just a reminder that uh, the power of being a Jedi is the philosophy. And for a young girl to be able to say, maybe I can move things with my mind, but what matters right now is I was taught this philosophy of be sure you're doing the right thing. Know what you're facing. Take a deep breath. Steady yourself. Be present. Be ready be sure of yourself like that that's plenty of jedi power all by itself yeah i i I like i like that you you went that direction with it because that's where i think i was at in my head too of 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 and i'm not saying this to to deride people that look at it this way but it it isn't the force points on the back of your card it isn't your fighting style it isn't the color of your blade those are all fun uh seasonings in the jedi soup that we all enjoy (laughs) i I think it is is exactly what you're talking about it it, 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 we all can do that and and it should translate to our own world and our own life and none of us here are going to be moving objects with our minds that we know of uh maybe one day we will (laughs) Uh, government-funded programs to bend spoons and talk to goats. I get it, but like, uh, <laughs> it, it, it is, it is, it is exactly what you're saying. This is the this is the Jedi way because the Jedi way is about being connected to yourself, to the world around you, and uh, and that's the power of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Any uh, any other big picture thoughts before we take a quick break, Jen? No, I want to meditate though now. I mean, that, yeah. that is the Jedi way, being able to quiet your mind, right? Yep. Being able to quiet your mind yeah. and just take that moment. Yep. In the moment, we'll see what comes next. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, what's coming next for us is we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we are recording as the eclipse happens. So maybe we'll start moving things with our minds because of the eclipse. Who knows? We'll find out right after this break back in a moment. And we are back to continue our discussion of the most recent episodes of The Bad Batch, episode 10 and episode 11 of the third season. We talked some of the big ideas. It's also fun to talk all the big canon lore and all that kind of stuff. So uh, as Ken had mentioned, we got some uh, good Project Necromancer uh, details and clarifications. Uh, This was one of those episodes where it felt like (laughs) Hemlock had been maybe getting some social media posts from Star Wars fans. It's like, okay, let me clarify. (laughs) Uh, they, we had the question of why children, aren't there plenty of adults who have a high M count? Uh, and he's got the kind of ominous, there are few adults, uh, left with such Mm -hmm. characteristics. He goes on to be like, yeah, these kids don't know what it is. They don't know why we're taking their blood. They don't, we don't, other than wanting to go home, they don't know what's at stake and why they should resist and all that. Um, uh, Jennifer, how did you feel about that clarification, uh, uh, from a storytelling point, from an emotional point of why, why aren't they just, you know, they, they've got Jedi to become inquisitors. Why, why aren't they taking adult Jedi? Why aren't they using Darth Vader's blood? Th- these are the reasons they're using children. How'd you feel about it? Oh, it was devastating because there are a lot of adults that believe that kids don't get it. They're like, oh, don't, mm. don't tell the kid, don't fill it in, fill the kid in on why you're leaving to go to the store, right? Kids no, kids sense things. They, especially in that situation, they're going to know that something is up, right? This is not <laughs> this is not a camp. Something is up. And so it's just, it was so cruel. And it was very much a, a real world perspective that I see a lot where it's like, eh, they don't know. They'll forget. They're going to, they'll grow up and they'll never remember this stuff. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, 
They do. We see it. You're not paying attention to the, the behavior. Well, he is paying attention. He doesn't care about the behavior that they're exhibiting. Mm -hmm. Oof, what a moment. Yeah. I was really affected by it. It flashed in my head of you know, Palpatine's line in Revenge of the Sith, <laughs> where he seems just a little bit haunted uh, when he says, the Jedi are relentless <laughs> to Anakin. You know, he's manipulating Anakin, but it's a moment to me of like true fear. He does. Mm -hmm. He talks a big game, but I think Palpatine does fear the Jedi. You know, he's got him as Inquisitors. He's turned them. He's broken them. He, there's, there's ones he's not messing with. So he's having them killed by Vader and the Inquisitors, right? This project is everything to him. It's about his ability to continue. And I like that sort of specter of Palpatine's fear of like, yeah, I know you, I can't have adult Jedi. Don't, mm -hmm. don't find Quinlan Voss and put him there. He'll, leap everything up I, I need i need children <laughs> not Ooh. not adult jedi who might mess with my perfect uh, need to continue myself ken how did you feel about the why children answer yeah it makes sense on, on, on palpatine's grand scheme he's someone who always wants to destroy the next generation anyways it's his not yours so it makes sense and that yeah the pain uh the 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 um, kind of haunting uh, ideas put forth here by Hemlock is kind of what you're talking about, Jed. I'm just like, eh, the, the children will eventually, I don't care what they feel or sense, and eventually they'll adapt. They'll just think this is how they live now. They get to play these games, they're <laughs> bored, but I don't care. There are specimens. Um, uh, someone, you know, 15 or older or 10 or old, whatever, they, they'd want to fight. They'd want to get out. But he's obviously misunder, you know, misunderstanding the situation. He's underestimating, like Jax, for example, tries to escape. Mm -hmm. Um, but in terms of just the Star Wars answers, um, you, Joseph, you mentioned earlier of, of why in 19 years do, is the the very name of Jedi uh, something in our in our past? Um, it's you know I always go to you know I think George in 77 might have intended it, but then the math of two 19 year old kids, you know, mm -hmm. even if you're just looking at Luke and New Hope, uh, the math doesn't add up, but. I think it's not just about explaining it. It's about making it make sense in a very real way. Uh, you can't even say the Je Jedi. You can't even say the Force. You have to whisper it. Um, uh, that's the opening scene here. So it all mm -hmm. kind of is part of the plan and how this happened. How by the time we meet old Ben Kenobi, it is an ancient, ancient thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it's powerful. Um, so we also get some clarity on on Force cloning. Uh Mm -hmm. Hemlock says, as you know, M count cannot be directly replicated from the source. And I think that's just a, the first most clear answer of like, yeah, Palpatine can't just straight up clone himself and go, oh, same amount of midi chlorines. And I yeah. think there's this attempt to like, well, let's make another CP52. And like, OK, well, they don't mm -hmm. they don't have the same M count. It degrades. We've heard that before that the M count degrades. Mm -hmm. So now we've got this clarity. Uh, Hemlock goes on to say, however, Nalase knew of another way, which is why she aided in Omega's escape. The young clone's blood is the only binder that's proven to be compatible with their DNA to recreate their M count levels. Mm -hmm. uh, Jennifer, how do you feel about that clarity of uh, Omega's blood makes it possible to basically make a clone and uh, of somebody with mm -hmm. high M count and uh, not have the M count degrade if you mix in a little bit of a, a Omega's blood as a mm -hmm. as a binder? I thought it was very helpful for somebody that struggles with science. I was like, please spell it out for me. Give me a chart. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> pull down, pull down the projector. Let's, let's go through this because I, I was wondering myself. I'm like, oh, hey, how does that work? So thank show it you. to me like a trench run with <laughs> exactly. 70s graphics. That's what I need a visual learner. So yeah, yeah. I appreciated that. Yeah. That clarification. Yeah. Ken, how did you feel mm -hmm. about it? Uh, uh, it all, it all makes sense. And I'm like you, Jen, I need, I needed, uh, Hemlock to be like, all right, let me pull down my flow chart here and show you what's going on. Uh, yeah, the, I think I've always taken it, uh, this way from the beginning of just like, no, you can't just simply, you know, you don't have a bunch of Palpatines. That's why it didn't work. That's why he had a, a forceless son, you know, <laughs> like you're a waste to me. It also speaks, I think to, even with, you know, we're talking about clones, but going back to Yoda in the beginning of the Clone Wars series of, you're clones, but you have your own identity. So it's like you can't just, you know, you can't just make a Palpatine uh, because, uh, you know, that person, that body, that blood has its own identity, its own purpose, its own, con con uh, you know, connection with the Force uh, uh, or, or the galaxy. And so uh, I, I like it. It all makes sense to me as, as far as I can understand it, my limited brain power. Um, and that uh, the whole the binding, I wrote that down too, of uh, mm -hmm. the midi-chlorians can stick to her in a way. So I kind of <laughs> look at it too. 
yeah, I like the I like just the the clarity of the science, and I think we're probably going to get even more is yeah. is Project Necromancer. I think is Delta setback probably uh, in this mm-hmm. uh, final season of Bad Batch, but it also just made me think of ideas about the Force and cloning. We've always we talk a lot about that scene in in Ambush, the first mm-hmm. Clone Wars episode of Yoda saying they're all unique in the Force and. Mm-hmm. But I hadn't really stopped to really think about how Star Wars was sort of playing with these uh, very old science fiction ideas. You know, people credit Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as being one of the originals, if not the original science fiction book. And that is dealing mm-hmm. with the merging of science and nature. Can you recreate uh, life? And, uh, and what is the responsibility if you do? Can humans play, uh, you know, creator? Um, mm-hmm. So... Uh, all this stuff about them having a hard time just making another exact copy of something just made me feel like the force is sort of, even with all the science, the force is just always insisting that everybody is unique in individual. Mm -hmm. Like you cannot just make an exact copy of someone. They're going to be a little different because the force values the organic and the flowing and the different. That's kind of where some of my mind went with the philosophy of it as well. So I'm interested to see how much more they, they deal with that. Yeah, absolutely. I like that. Uh, we talked a little bit about Cad Bane. Um, so I just want to check in if there's any other thoughts. I, I thought it was really different to to see him again after spending more time with book, him in Book of Boba Fett, knowing his mm-hmm. end. Um, people had some funny memes. I believe it was our friend Brian Ward who <laughs> uh, shared a, the screen capture of uh, Cad Bane's end going, you know, really wish, uh, really excited for this to happen to Cad Bane. Uh, Ken, <laughs> did you have any other Cad Bane thoughts? I just I, I really like the use of him and I think I absolutely and I think other people were expecting quote unquote more of him this season because he shows up in the trailer, you got Fennec Shan, there's a thought we're gonna spend a lot of time in the underworld. I, you know, I, I think if this is all we get, it makes perfect sense. It's one of those things of who would be doing this at this point in the storyline? Who's alive, who's around, who would be a class one bounty hunter? It's this guy we've seen before and then we can you know break it down like we did earlier so i i think this is the 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 purpose of cad bane in this show in the series much like ventress it, you know in and out fennec shan in and out it's great use of these characters tying them to the story and then we go focus on who we need to focus on in this series yeah absolutely jennifer any other cad bane thoughts it just adds a little bit of depth to that scene to see somebody that we character that we already know right Mm -hmm. we know his history we know his end so (laughs) i really liked how they used him and i agree if this is it i'm fine with it it was just the right amount um but it Mm -hmm. was yeah because i was like what if it was some random bounty hunter it wouldn't have the same kind of heft to the scene Mm -hmm. Uh, i really liked that they used him yeah me too and it just really our, our talk is really making me remember like what a badass he is in the clone wars and and how sad and pathetic his role in this is and kind of yeah. a reminder that like the bad guys are cool they look cool they sound cool but like what a sad being cad bane is ultimately mm. you know i would i wouldn't have minded if it was dengar though and he shows up oh. and he's like ah oh, one if i miss this one i'm gonna be a class two i told mrs dengar i gotta get it i gotta get it the bunny mom kicked my ass. <laughs> <laughs> I got demoted to a class seven bounty hunter. Oh, man. Yeah. I like yeah. That. Uh, yeah. Um, so h- how did you guys feel about the presence in the ongoing question of the identity of CX2? Um, for me, I kind of, mm-hmm. every time he appears and we don't get that helmet off, we don't get the identity. <laughs> it, it ratchets up that tension and that question. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't spent a lot of time on social media. I'm sure people are buzzing about this, but the fact that he broke fees encryption, I'm sure is fueling some, maybe he's a, mm. a tech clone or, you know, in a brainwash, you know, surviving version of tech. Um, mm-hmm. the, it, mm-hmm. it looked like Hemlock was examining uh, more clone X troops. And after that mm-hmm. Tarkin threat, um, he tabs over to uh, another design and, and he tells CX2 explicitly, the other operatives aren't ready to join you in the field. So we got the mm. ongoing question mm. of CX2's identity, and we also feel like it feels like around the corner, um, it feels like Helmuck's got his next model of whatever the CX... I mean, the, the CX clones that we've met so far were just brainwashed clones, um, mm. but it seems like there's something different with with this one. Uh, Ken, how, how are you feeling about all that CX2 intrigue and, and more clone uh, uh, troopers from Hemlock? 
Yeah, even even as you're speaking, I'm like, oh, there's, there's no way it's tech. Oh, it's definitely tech, but it could be Cody. No, Cody walked away, and that was such a powerful moment. No, nah, I don't think about that. Uh, I don't know. It, it it it's and that's the fun of it, and that's it's fun. Mm-hmm. I think I, I accidentally wore our old Speculate Responsibly T-shirt today because um, I think I want to try to be responsible to myself. There's there there'd be God, even with the tech goggles today, I took the tech goggles mm-hmm. thing as like a, hey, he's gone. Right, he's right. gone. Right, like mm-hmm. let, let's all acknowledge it, and he's gone. And I still think, in the end of the day, that might be uh, the answer I'd like. Um, but then, even going back to stuff you were talking about in the off season, Joseph, about ah, how horribly painful it would be to be a tech two point oh. That's not quite him, especially now. This is what he's doing, and he doesn't even know what he's doing. Or maybe you know, has uh, it's not him, so it's not it's not him directly. So there's a faint feeling of I know these people, but now they're just targets to me. I don't know. The Cody thing, I know it was out there for a while. It doesn't make as much sense to me as this goes on. But as, mm-hmm. as you said, the tension being ratcheted up, I was like, oh, this might hurt. This might yeah. Hurt. Jennifer, how are you feeling about the CX2 identity mystery? I figured it was tech until this episode with the goggles. The same thing. I'm like, they're, they're telling us fans, no, he's dead, dead. Put his arrest. Yeah. <laughs> right? But then I was like, ah, oh, but it just makes sense. And it would be, it's going to be a great reveal. But now I'm getting impatient where I'm like, let's just get this reveal over with. I want to mm-hmm. know who is, who it is or, yeah. or what. Yeah, I think that's the the you know we, we've talked about this before. It, it's a it's a great part of being a fan, the fun of speculating. But mm-hmm. but we can overdo it, and you know the internet has you know ongoing jokes about you know Mephisto because every time it's a you know a mystery of of who the bad guy is in MCU, P- people are sure Mephisto's coming. Uh, there's mm-hmm. a joke in Doctor Who communities of it, it's not Susan because it's a character featured in the very beginning of Doctor Who, and every time there's a mystery woman. <laughs> that you don't know who it is. Everybody's like, is it Susan? So, I mean, it's a part, it's a thing that goes across fandom where it's fun to speculate, but then yeah. we become uh, uh, obsessive about those answers. Um, and it's almost, yeah. we've been talking about the way like, hey, Fennec was in the trailer, Cad Bane was in the trailer, Asajj was in the trailer, but we didn't get any answers about Asajj's resurrection. And like, the, the show never promised us those things. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. show is building up and promising us something with CX2, I think. Mm by spending this long and this much focus on the character. And I think that's, what's ratcheting up the tension for me of like, it's one thing if we, the fans make an assumption, we saw a shot in a trailer. So we assume a whole storyline that the creators never intended. That's on us. In Mm -hmm. my opinion, Mm -hmm. the creators are putting CX2 in front of us and not taking off that damn helmet. It's making it feel like I I really do hope there's something uh, emotionally powerfully resonant about the reveal yeah 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 tech tech 2.0 cross yeah. cross her <laughs> yeah. cross her oh my god tech hair, tech um, hair. <laughs> uh, yeah i think it is a possibility that he that he is a mingled clone of the bad batch i also do think it's a possibility that he is not not that tech survived that fall but they took tech's dna off tech, those broken yeah. goggles and that that's another narrative point of them and yep. that they made they made a tech with the same skills Mm -hmm. uh, and trained him up. uh, And that to me, I think I'm, I'm interested in, because I think it could have emotionally resonant power for Omega to be like, do you know, do you know where you come from? Like you're your own person. You don't have the life experiences that tech did, but do you want to know the, what, what, what that person, what your progenitor chose to do with his abilities do you mm-hmm. want to live up to that there's an angle in there to something emotional you know other than just being painful yeah. but for an argument of evolution and change mm-hmm. yeah it's it's a great text still has a great wonderful why wonderful being painful um mm-hmm. and, and and you know i think we're all three in the same boat but like yeah even out even out in the wild if you if you approach me at a bar with a great theory about star wars i need to know the why otherwise i i bluntly just don't care i'll figure it out i'll find out mm-hmm. when, they, when they want yeah. us to know um right. and 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 there's there's a big dangling why <laughs> <laughs> there's a big dangling why uh last bit of canon i have is uh <laughs> this was a triumph for background weirdos um there it was uh, the the bunny guy uh, who it turns out his name is a Wamoth, uh in Solo. There the the little bunny guy who congratulates Solo when he thinks he's won oh, yeah. the Sabak game. And right. for quite a while, um, 
he was a background weirdo that didn't have a name yet. And he stood out to some of us. We're like, we like that bunny guy. And we like mm-hmm. knowing the weirdo Star Wars names. And I remember even with trivia, the, you know, mm-hmm. when a bunch of us were doing the schmo down mm-hmm. uh, before it was released, people were like, we can't find the name of the, the bunny yeah. guy. <laughs> uh, but- turns out his name, I think, was in, I can't remember what, like fascinating mm-hmm. facts or something. Whammoth. Uh, but this is a triumph uh, for background weirdos that the mother and the uh, the poor abducted child and the toy, uh, their mm-hmm. species is a, a Tarlafars. Mm-hmm. Her name was Ailish. His name was Bairn. Um, you know, a lot of times they would just use, like, these could have been Athorians. They got the models, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was a great connective tissue to be like, hey, you all like that one design in Solo. We'll take mm-hmm. the time to build new models and have a, a this additional emotional connection for us kind of really in the bubble because <laughs> yeah. as soon as it started it's like wow this is so deep we're getting to see the tragedy oh the toy thing is affecting me oh those are the bunny guys <laughs> yeah. It, yeah it had an emotional resonance for me uh jennifer how do you feel about uh this uh bunny family well that makes sense because i was like why do these look familiar that's why okay so uh yeah i'm so behind on my on my creatures and species um but i just loved it it was such a great it was such a great detail and as i said i love the noises that were very specific and grogu like um but yeah great i want a little stuffed plush of that yeah character yeah and just effective that they do look like little little bunny people with four ears and really cute and lovely uh ken how did you feel about the triumph of the of the bunny people <laughs> again as i said up top uh, it, it, it i knew the solo connection but like there, there was it was the perfect species to break my heart because it's just a cute cuddly bunny slash pet dog cat kind of kitten kind of vibe and i was i was in my feels about having to leave my dogs and, and grace too don't worry mm-hmm. uh but leave my dogs for five days and uh it, it was it was a perfect choice and, and it uh you know we, i love we love that movie i love that movie so much uh solo star mm-hmm. wars story and so anytime mm-hmm. it gets represented on screen a little smile on my soul yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk about uh, favorite moments. Uh, these episodes were just full of comedy. No, no, yeah. they were not. Uh, but uh, Ken, what were some favorite moments? Be they action, whimsy, heartbreaking, just a great shot. Yeah, uh, yeah. There was a, the great shots were all there. I think, I think that in the heartbreak, but even the the the, the Marauder exploding and just like you know, CX uh, was he two or three? He's CX two. I believe he's CX two. Is what I uh, yeah. thought I had found this morning on right, old right. Wikipedia. Um, tech. Uh, when he launches the uh, the little grenades <laughs> on there, everything about it—the sound design, the the realization on Wrecker's uh, face—loved um, all that. Uh, the Empire, you mentioned earlier, but the Empire showing up and just the way you know, they, I think it's Crosshair. It's like we've been compromised. They don't—they don't have time to react. They're already here. The Empire's already here. Mm. Um, it's such a Star Warsy shot. A star destroyer over a city or over a planet, uh, but it's it's always got great purpose to me. Even as we've broken down before, the Im- Imperial March is an oppressive march over the galaxy. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is the design behind it. So uh, I love little moments like that. Um, and and just in terms of uh, the, the first episode, has it's such a it's such a sad ballad of an episode, right? It, it's it's this wonderful piece of of moody art. Just the time they took with Emery. Uh, and, and, and pushing in on uh, her face and her glasses, even have having I think uh, Ava said, "I like your glasses." Like <laughs> it's just every detail about Emery and the time that they took to get this all kind of working in her soul was favorite stuff for me. Yeah, mm-hmm. great stuff, uh, Jennifer. Favorite moments. The music in the first of the two episodes was so great. Having been through a lot of royalty-free music <laughs> over the weekend, <laughs> you're looking for certain key words. And it's specifically when you're deal- dealing with like children or youth, there's like, a, you'll actually say like child or children in the description. And immediately when I heard the music, I'm like, oh, I can tell there, there's like this little thing. And I, I, if I were listening to it again, I would know the instrument. Right. But there's just something that like, there's this childlike theme that's woven, but it's haunting. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Oh my gosh. And then you combine that with Emery. And there was a moment, I think when she gives the the doll uh, to Eva and she, her shoulders, she's like sighs. Mm-hmm. It was such a small detail, but I'm like, Gosh, these people are incredible. Like you're saying, Ken, taking that time, every little detail, just really making this character feel so real. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. There's a ton of great moments like that. One of the one of the shots that I loved is when uh, Jax tries to escape and he slips on the floor. Yes. A little bit. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I kind of had a flashback to like growing up with some of the like super cheap uh, like filmation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like mm-hmm. E-Man in the 80s where you're like, well, we need to reuse every shot. We only have, yeah. we have one bit of film where He-Man rolls and we're going to use it every episode to this level <laughs> so of animation true. where that detail of him slipping so believably where you could mm-hmm. feel mm-hmm. those cold, hard, mm-hmm. polished floors and like yeah. moment that like totally like doesn't need to be there, but mm-hmm. enhances it and makes it feel so real. I love that moment. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, and, and and the animation team, the the directors, the people putting them together, you know, deserve high praise. We we try to give it to them all, every episode. We do this, and I, you know, just because you know, on a live set, you got an actor making a choice. You got to hey, let's try this instead. Let's try this take, and and here, there's a little more planning involved. So to, to build in those little moments, those very realistic moments, it's it's uh, takes a lot of foresight and skill. And they get yeah, it. find mm-hmm. those it, it, yeah. Um, we, we talked about the the opening uh, with the the kid you know, being hunted for uh, being gifted. Mm -hmm. But I really like that line. People say he's cursed and then, you know, gifted. It's Mm -hmm. really ominous, but it's also like that, that line, that exact choice of dialogue, you know, it could have just been more flat of like, you Mm -hmm. think that kid might be a Jedi or whatever. Um, It just really drove home. They like that. It's that it's cursed that you're cursed to be gifted in this era, Mm -hmm. that if you Mm -hmm. have any power, it belongs to Palpatine and it's, it's dangerous yeah. to have power. It's dangerous to be yourself. I thought that was really put across by he's cursed gifted it was yeah. really powerful. A um, mm. couple of uh, kind of more actual fun moments there from fee. <laughs> nah. uh, I didn't really notice him the first time around. Cause I was too busy watching a uh, 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 CX2 tech hair, uh, whoever mm. he is. Uh, sh- uh, get on her ship, but she's having that fun banter with her droid, and she says, "Who cares if your panels don't match? Patchy bodywork shows grit." <laughs> it's just a, a funny thing to say to a droid, and it also feels like an, a million conversations I've <laughs> with uh, people about why the original trilogy design is good. Like it's it's gritty when it's re- it looks real and lived yeah. in. <laughs> like Fee yeah. saying, "Like you got that original trilogy look." Mel two two one. That's yeah. funny. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. other moment of just little tiny bit of whimsy that was there in the uh, the second episode is when the ship is flying all wonky and <laughs> I'm like, it says Crosshair is that Hunter and Crosshair mm-hmm. says, uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll cling to any little bit of whimsy in those episodes. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Any other moments that either you would like to share before we move on? No, no. I think we covered all. I, I at one point. Stop even marking down moments because I was pulled in by the darkness. I, you know, Toto, Toto's an interesting character. I love, I'd love to go into the archives, figure out why they were like, hey, we got this big bad bounty hunter who shows, who shows up to the public with the kidnapping episode first. The actual canonical order, he's a little mm-hmm. bit different. It shows up earlier, but we all met him when he's doing some horrific things in the Clone Wars. Let's give him just the wise assiest of droids. <laughs> Let's just, just so funny. Toto's Toto's interesting choice. Uh, dopey little like. weirdo, and maybe maybe yeah. Cad Bane is gonna you know appear again, so Toto can complete yeah. his his emotional arc. Uh, maybe. <laughs> um, the, the, all the action stuff with Hunter was great too. It's sad that it didn't work mm-hmm. out, but a lot of yeah. lot of cool moves there. Um, was there anything, Jennifer, in these two episodes that you disliked or questioned or struggled with in any way? No, I mean, I, I like we talked about. I kind of predicted where the episode was headed, I, mm-hmm. you know. But that's to be expected because obviously we talk about this every week, and mm-hmm. and you know we're just we're also. I figured that this was kind of a moment that was I don't want to say telegraphed for the younger audience, but um, but yeah, it just it is what it is. I'm fine with it. Yeah, I, I think that too. I think that's sort of, sort of the nature of the beast of being in the bubble and, and really loving this show and, and being in a community where we're going to, if you're not going to do it personally, someone else is going to freeze frame every part of the trailer. And like, exactly. there's a part of me is like, well, they shouldn't have put in anything at Pablo. And like, there, then there's a part of me is like, let's take a step back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is also for general audiences that yeah, are yeah. not going to pause right. every scene to look for. For Pabu, and I'm not judging anyone. We all no. process it in different ways, but I also like, I, yeah, I want to be careful not to. They have to walk the line of. We need some exciting shots in the in the trailer. We need to make this for a general audience, not just for for uh, the freeze framers out there. Um, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, we knew we knew this was coming, but I'm not going to ding them for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ken. 
Yeah, no, didn't dislike any of that for the reasons you both listed. It, I, I remember the story I told it being at a Walgreens and I put down a Chewbacca with a Porg Funko and the guy was like, I love Star Wars. And he said, what's that bird? I said, it's the Porg from Last Jedi, the new Star Wars. And he went, they made new Star Wars films? Like, <laughs> <laughs> That's impressive. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was impressive. Wow. Um, 100% true story too. But so yeah, yeah, I knew what was coming too, or at least we knew we were getting here and that that's just us. That's just us in the circle because it's fun. Because it's fun, uh, you know. I did some freeze framing on the other trailer. We're going to break down on the episode this uh, the episodes this week. Uh, it's part of the fun, uh, but so nothing against the show. Yeah, no. I, the, the only I just not. I love it. I I don't question it. But these are this is a really darker season, right? The tones are so somber and, and real and, and powerful, and and uh, I think it's a brave decision. I'm not questioning it. Um, I just uh, I, I hope I hope we get some happy hopeful resolution in a bigger darker era which is the age of of the empire uh, it's the only thing i'm looking forward to in the last four episodes yeah i mean obviously the clones are not going to topple the empire but i am yeah. looking forward to some sort of emotional victories for the bad totally. batch and for the clones in general and and the way i'm feeling about it is like yeah we we knew this was going back to tantus and a part mm -hmm. of that is like, you know, uh, I love thinking about storytelling like music, where even if you're not particularly musically inclined it, and you don't know the note, but you can hear and humans hear and feel resolution. You you can hear mm -hmm. the the note that brings you home and resolves the song. And we sense it yeah. when it, when something doesn't resolve. And, and to me, this is like it's a very musical show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tantus is is the note that's going to resolve this. And, I you know, I, and I'm looking forward to hearing it. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Uh, all right. We always try to end with a fun question. <laughs> uh, if we could have a figure or merch of any character or idea or anything from this episode, who or what do we want? How many toys do we want? Ken, what do you want? I want like uh, with a gentle giant uh, kind of figure, a sculpture. I want a record grabbing uh, gonky. Just, uh, hmm. uh, like forever hmm. frozen. That's good. <laughs> I was Same imagining, yeah. Life. A gentle giant statue of uh, of crosshair firing, and then there's like a little invisible piece of plastic that shows the <laughs> thing on this <laughs> downward arc. Oh, no. <laughs> Be awful. Uh, well, I I was I just actually googled like, wait a minute, the actual original Lula doll? Did they ever make that? And I googled it, and like Disney stores was were selling it, but it sold oh, out. Yeah. So that's yeah. what I want. I want Lula back in stock. Damn it. There you go, mm. uh, Jennifer. How about you? I want the bunny mama and kid because uh, I've mentioned I have a, a Monchichi with her mm -hmm. baby. I want that, mm -hmm. my Star Wars version of that. Yeah, that would be great. I, one of the stuffed animals I had till I was in sixth grade was a, a little raccoon with its <gasps> arms around a little raccoon baby. Mm -hmm. so we can all add that to the connection. So, so lovely. Give us the bunnies. Give us the bunnies <laughs> we demand. The Tarlafars. <laughs> okay. Hashtag give us the Tarlafars. There we go. Uh, all right. That is our big look at these episodes of Bad Batch. We'll be back on our normal schedule uh, in a couple of days uh, talking mm -hmm. about the upcoming episode of Bad Batch this coming Wednesday. That episode will be out later in the day. Can you want to let people know where they can find us? I do, I do, uh, and thank you to all who uh, allowed us uh, the time to get these episodes out. We appreciate your patience on that. And I want to say this too. Could I, I go on a little curveball here? I want to shout out. I just saw before we set the record, James Bainey, the Resistance broadcast, has announced that he's uh, leaving the Resistance broadcast mm. after seven years to spend time wow. with his family and do other things. And uh, John and Lacey are going to continue the Resistance broadcast. Uh, fine folks, uh, wish mm -hmm. them luck uh, as they move on to a new era. But uh, tip of the cap to James. He's a great guy. We had we had a lot where he. Watched me eat one day at a at a, at a, at a Burbank restaurant because he was swinging by the Jedi Council. Said, "A uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful human, uh, James Tim of the Cap." To your work over the last seven years over there, uh, we're the Four Center Podcast or the Four Center Show. You can find us on Twitter, uh, Instagram, <laughs> Threads, Hive. Uh, dog barks. You can find us all at uh, there at Force Center Pod. We're uh, on uh, Facebook as Force Center Podcast. Uh, subscribe on the YouTube channel, please, if you will, if you want, and uh, share us there. Uh, don't forget you can get merch like the Speculate Responsibly T-shirt that's still there uh, at tpublic.com/user/slash Force Center. You can support us directly at patreon.com/slash 
Force Center. Uh, we uh, also, uh, you can follow us on our own individual pursuits. Follow me at Catnapsock or Catnapsock.com. I've updated information soon on more shows. Shout out to Elias and Chris and David, uh, some Force Center friends uh, who were out at the show in Boston at the Rockwell with me and Mark Ellis on Saturday. It's great to meet you, shake hands, and talk for uh, a moment. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, all the information for future shows on my website. Jen, where can they find you? You can find me and my dog, Mala, on all the social media sites at Jennifer Landa or TikTok at Jennifer Landa 1138. There you go, Joseph. Wonderful stuff. We've all been exhausted. We've all been traveling, but you you, you planted your feet on the ground and got us through it here thank today. You. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you. And, and you always have amazing insights, uh, both of you, no matter how many little theme ideas uh, I write down. Uh, I always uh, get to learn and think about it in new and different ways. So thank you both. Um, and thank you for everyone who leaves uh, comments and shares your thoughts. It's really fun to hear all the different ways to process uh, these episodes. Uh, for myself personally, you can find me on all the different social media at Joseph Scrimshaw is my handle everywhere. If you want to keep up with some of my film adventures, you can check my website. It's just josephscrimshaw.com. There are more screenings coming up uh, for The Nightmare Adorable. I don't have the information up yet, but it is going to be screening at a big uh, convention in Seattle, uh, Crypticon, the first weekend of May. Uh, I think I'm probably going to be going to that one. We'll see how I manage to go to Seattle and see The Phantom Menace, uh, but I'm going to figure it out. Uh, other thing I want to mention real quick, as uh, the election season begins to heat up for several months, uh, I am working on writing some letters with a group called Vote Forward. Their website is votefwd.org. And what it is is you just uh, write a short message about why you think voting is important. Uh, you send it to uh, different voters, uh, and it has been proven, they followed up, that it increases voter turnout. And for me, it's a little concrete thing that I can do to encourage people uh, to use their power. That is it. Uh, we have had The Bad Batch. <laughs> <laughs>